who are the Christadelphians. <coughs> and it's rather, I guess, sometimes unusual to say, well, we're talking about a subject of who are the Christadelphians when about 95% of the audience are Christadelphians. Um, and those in the audience who are not, who may not call themselves a Christadelphian would know a fair bit about Christadelphians having had somewhat to do with them. So who are the Christadelphians? So I guess a good way to answer that question, because I can't answer for somebody else. I, I can't answer for Lionel or another Christadelphian per se. Initially, I want to answer for myself. I am a Christadelphian. So I've got just a couple minutes to tell somebody what it means to me. I believe in the Bible that it is God's word, true and accurate. The world has a purpose. God created it and his purpose is to fill the earth with his glory. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will return to the earth very soon, I believe, to establish a just, pure and holy government to rule upon the whole earth and therefore give glory to God. I want to be involved in God's kingdom. And because of this, I'm trying to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm trying to, to live like him. I read the Bible regularly and I endeavour to make time to study it in detail. I realise that the values and the morals that I hold as a result of reading the Bible are sometimes seen as so fundamental or old conservative. There are many things that, that lots of people in our society do that I don't do or that I don't agree with. It takes sacrifice of my own desires to follow in Jesus' steps. But this is the only way that I can truly become like him, living forever and working in God's kingdom. No one forces me to do any of this. It's my choice. So there you go. That was hopefully the elevator ride was long enough to say all of that. That's what I think um, I'd like to say as a Christadelphian. Now, I'm no better than anybody else. And what I mean by that is I try and read the Bible regularly. I try and do the right thing. I fail often and I'm a hypocrite. And for that matter, all Christadelphians are hypocrites. We are no better or special than anybody else. Sometimes people know that and sometimes people suddenly realise that and it seems a shock to them. But nonetheless, we try and follow Jesus Christ. So what I want to go through tonight is some history, a little bit of history about Christadelphians and I want to look at some examples of what other people, when I say other people, some things that I have found on the internet say about Christadelphians, in a positive sense. We believe, Christadelphians, we believe that our teachings and our doctrines are the same as those taught by the apostles in the New Testament. And that's one of the reasons that we read the Bible regularly, and one of the reasons we study the Bible in detail is to try and test and prove and reprove and confirm whether or not what we're doing and what we're teaching is in agreement with the Bible. I'm sure we all know that the name Christadelphian is relatively modern. About 150 years ago, it came into existence. In 1832, a doctor called John Thomas, living in Britain, set sail to America to start a new life in America. On the way there, on the coast off of Canada, his ship was nearly destroyed and it led to this uh, sudden realisation that should he die, he had, would have no idea what was going to happen after death. So he made this vow that he would search and find out the truth about God and the Bible should he live long enough to set foot on land again. 
Well, he did reach America and he did follow that through. He spent the rest of his life studying and searching out the Bible. It took him a number of years to, to sort of discover what he believed to be the truth of the Bible. During this period of formulating his ideas, he was baptised twice, uh, the second time after announcing the beliefs he previously held. He based his new position on the appreciation for the reign of Christ on David's throne. John Thomas returned to Britain for a few years. In 1848, he toured around preaching the truth of the Bible for a couple of years. It was during this time back in Britain that he was asked to put in writing his beliefs, which led to the book Elpis Israel. Now, it's important for me to say, and it's important for all of us to understand, that Although the Christadelphian movement, as we know today, originated through the activities largely of John Thomas and other people, he never saw himself as making his own disciples. We are not followers of John Thomas or Robert Roberts or, or, or other early Christadelphian you know, pioneers of this modern age. He believed rather that he had only rediscovered first century beliefs from the Bible alone. And all of us are striving to believe what has been written in the Bible, not following various men of our age. There we have a um, photograph of John Thomas and we have uh, a transcript of what is written upon his tombstone. Here lies in brief repose, awaiting the return of the Lord from heaven, John Thomas, MD, author of Elpis Israel, Eureka, Anastasis, Phanerosis and other works. In his works and lectures he demonstrated the unscriptural character of popular Christianity and brought to light anew the long lost faith of the apostles. Thy word is truth. During a busy lifetime by mouth and pen he contended earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints and at his death left behind him as a result of his labours a body of people in different parts of the world known as Christadelphians to continue the work begun. So he has done a great deal for helping us discover the truth of the Bible. So yes, we, we lean upon his works because there is not a single thing from a doctrinal sense that he has said that we would disagree with. But he's just a person. He's not a prophet. He doesn't claim to have received any vision from God. He is just a person like you and me. Let's talk about this name Christadelphian because he's a person that, that essentially came up with the term Christadelphian. It was during the time of the American Civil War to be able to register for conscientious objection as a group of believers, we needed to have a name, to, uh, to be, you know, a proper name, to be considered a body, and in the process of that, the name Christadelphian was chosen. Let's turn to a couple of the quotes on the screen. Um, the first one, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 2. We turn our Bibles across to Colossians 1 and verse 2. The name Christadelphian is a collection of some Greek words and essentially it means a brother in Christ or, or brother or sister of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, looking for Galatians, Ephesians, here we go. Philippians, Colossians, I've got it. Colossians 1 and verse 2. Well, we'll starting in verse 1. Paul is writing a letter to a group of believers, essentially a group of Christadelphians, shall we say, that lived in Colossae. He begins his letter in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. See that brethren in Christ? That, 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 sort of, those, that collection of English words there is essentially this word term Christadelphian. To the saints and 
faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the term Christadelphian. We're nearby. Let's just turn to Hebrews as well. That last quote, Hebrews 2 and verse 12. Here we have Paul again writing to the Hebrews and he's, he's talking about Jesus Christ and effectively he's quoting Jesus Christ. Um, Hebrews 2 verse 12 saying, this is Jesus saying, or Paul's, this is Paul writing going, this is what Jesus said, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Jesus is saying, I will declare thy name or God's name to his brethren or his brothers or sisters. His family, which is interesting because he was an only child. He's the only begotten son of God. But as a group of believers, we call ourselves his brothers or his sisters. Sorry? Verse 11. Yes, for both he that sanctifies and they that are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Thank you, Lionel. So as far as Jesus is concerned, he has brothers and sisters. Now, he had stepbrothers and sisters, literally, but that's not what he's referring to. He's referring to people who have adopted his way of life. Talking about being ad- adopting his way of life, if we turn back to the reading that Lionel read for us tonight, back in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 24. This is actually one of the, um, the I guess, key points that John Thomas made about discovering what he believed to be the truth of God's word. Because It's important to say that as Christadelphians, we believe that by following God's word and becoming a disciple of Christ is the path towards being in God's kingdom. But there is only one path to God's kingdom. There's only one way. There are not many ways. So I'm going to say, and I'm sure we would all agree, that there are many religions. There are many different religions out there in the world. But if they don't believe the truth, which I don't believe they do, they are not leading towards the kingdom of God. It's this particular verse, for example, in verse 24, for we are saved by hope. In studying the Greek language, because the New Testament written in Greek, um, Brother Thomas, John Thomas, discovered that this word for hope has a a particular... um, sense about it. It is the hope. For we are saved by the hope. Not any hope, but a particular hope. Now what do we mean by a particular hope? Well it's not on the screen, but let's just turn, for example, to Ephesians. Quickly duck across to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians 4 we we get another example of what we mean by the hope. As far as there being a, a particular path, one particular path of correct belief or correct doctrine, shall we say, to understand God's message. Ephesians 4. Uh, oops, chapter 4. Pick up from verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So again, Paul is writing to a group of Christadelphians and he's talking about the way that they should conduct their lives, having unity in the bond of peace. And he makes this point in verse 4. There is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, 
who is above all and through all and in you all. Now when he talks about one body and one spirit, he's talking about, in the language which, of which he's been writing in this in these, uh, letter to the Ephesians, a body being a, a, a group of people built together, to, you know, individual people, but in, as a sign or in spiritual language, talking about being one body, parts of a body joined together, hence this term unity. But in, in, like, he makes a point in verse 5, there is one Lord. There's not seven lords, six faiths and 18 baptisms. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in, one hope of your calling. Now I make that point because it's an important point to make. Because if I have got it wrong, if I don't believe the gospel, if I don't believe the truth of God's word, then my belief is in vain and I have no hope. And I don't want that. And I hope that you don't want that. So what I need to do and what you need to do is read the word and consider the word and make sure what you believe and what I believe is correct. Just these quotes on the, on the screen up here. Um, it's interesting, there's, there's three quotations there. We won't turn them up, we'll save some time. Talking about our hope. Um, Paul says in Acts 23 verse 6, For the hope and resurrection of the dead... Um, he's bound. Sorry, not bound. For the hope and the resurrection of the dead, he believes. I forget what it says now. Let's turn to Acts 23. Sorry, I'm trying to make a point, and I forgot what I was going to say. Acts 23. Acts 23, verse six. It's hard to make a point when you can't remember what you're going to say, isn't it? But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees, two different sects amongst the Jewish believers, that's right, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, for I, for the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. So he, he divides the audience, essentially, by confirming the fact that he believes in the resurrection of the dead for the hope and resurrection of the dead. So he ties his belief or his hope in a future resurrection. He also goes on in Acts 26, which is on the screen, which we won't turn up, for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, referring to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So again, he ties his hope or his belief back to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And so should we. And then in Acts 28, for the hope of Israel, I am bound with these chains. So because of what God has promised to Israel, Paul is going through what he goes through because of what he believes. And that, as I'm sure we would know, this phrase, hope of Israel, is in actual fact the term Elpis Israel, which John Thomas named the book after. Okay, so here we are. We're an audience of Christadelphians. So if someone who has never heard of us before, never seen us before, goes onto the internet, what are they going to find out? Well, all manner of things, actually, because that's the wonders of the internet, isn't it? But if they went to Wikipedia, the next uh, half dozen slides are uh, a transcript, a transcript. I've taken straight off of Wikipedia. So I haven't written this, I haven't edited it. It is what Wikipedia says, or used to say. It might have changed now, because it could change at any point in time. Let's read it. Do we agree with it? I think so. I think largely what we're about to look at tonight, I wouldn't word it this way necessarily. I wouldn't say these things exactly in the same phrases, but I don't think that they're wrong. Due to the way the Christadelphian body is organised, there is no central authority to establish and maintain a standardised set of beliefs. And it depends what statement of faith is adhered to and how liberal the ecclesia is. But there are core doctrines most Christadelphians would accept. In the formal statements of faith, a more complete list is found. For instance, in the Central Fellowship, the BASF, 
The standard statement of faith has 30 doctrines to be accepted and 35 to be rejected. I think that's true, isn't it? So as a group of uh, ecclesias, as a group of ecclesias, we have no paid ministry. Each ecclesia is autonomous. There's no central authority, other than the Bible, you know, dictating to us what we have to do or how we have to live. Essentially, each group, each ecclesia, uh, sets their own guidelines based on a common statement of faith, what we all agree upon. But what do we mean by ecclesia? Well, I'm sure we know what we mean by ecclesia. Why do we talk about ecclesias and not churches? Because really, it's as simple as this. In the Bible, in the King James Version, many versions, we read the word church because guess what? Church is the English form of the Greek word ecclesia. So why don't we just call ourselves a church? Well, because we'd like to make a difference and, or, or make a point, and that being that this Greek word ecclesia really means a group of people called out with a purpose. Let's just turn to Acts 15. Acts 15, verse 14. It's not Acts 15, verse 14. We're not reading the word ecclesia or the word church. It actually occurs earlier on in the chapter, but that's not the point. The point is this. What the word means infers something. Acts 15, verse 14. Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, that's non-Jewish people, to take out of them a people... For his name. So that's the whole idea of a group of believers. An ecclesia is a group of people that have perhaps separated, not perhaps, but have actually, in one some way or another, separated themselves from the normal humdrum of humanity with a particular purpose to live their life differently because of what they believe. That's why we use the word ecclesia. I mean, if, if you turn to a dictionary, and any dictionary will do, I've got there the Oxford, OxfordDictionaries.com, um, here's what the word church means. The, the, the most common use of the word church is a building used for public Christian worship. And I'm not a building. It's not about a building. It's about the people. Uh, the second sort of way we can use the word is a particular Christian organisation with its own clergy, buildings and distinctive doctrines. Well, yeah, we have distinctive doctrines. Um, the hierarchy of clergy within a particular Christian church, well, it's not about hierarchy. Or, or the church can be used as an institutionalised religion, as a political or social force. The church says this. That's not what it's about. Hence, we try and avoid the term church because it just what it infers is not what the word actually means. That's why it's good to use the word ecclesia. Okay, that wasn't Wikipedia, that was just me. Back to Wikipedia. Under the heading of bo the Bible, um, Christadelphians state that their beliefs are based wholly on the Bible and they do not see other works as inspired by God. They regard the Bible as inspired... They regard the Bible as inspired by God and therefore believe that in its original form it is error-free... And errors in later copies are due to errors of transcription or translation. Based on this, Christadelphians teach that what they believe as true Bible teaching. So, I'd agree with that. Let's turn to Second of Timothy. Second of Timothy three. Quotation that we should know well. Second of Timothy three, verse fifteen. Again, the Apostle Paul writing to a Christadelphian called Timothy, who from a very early age was taught the Bible. In fact, in verse 15, Paul says this, and from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Paul says to Timothy, 
The Bible is God's word. It's inspired by God and it's got value. Read it and understand it. What does Wikipedia have to say that Christadelphians believe regarding God? Christadelphians believe that God is the creator of all things and the father of true believers, that he is a separate being from his son, Jesus Christ, and that the Holy Spirit is the power of God used in creation and for salvation. They also believe that the phrase Holy Spirit sometimes refers to God's character or mind depending on the context in which the phrase appears. But reject the view that we need strength, guidance and power from the Holy Spirit to live Christian life, believing instead that the spirit a believer needs within themselves is the mind or character of God, <coughs> excuse me, which is developed in a believer by their reading of the Bible, which they believe contains God's word, gave by his spirit, and trying to live by what it says during the events of their life, which God uses to help shape their character. We believe that there is one God. Not three gods. Not a trinity. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Written by Moses. In the first instance, written to the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, the, the beginnings of the nation of Israel, who believed, and still believe, for that matter, in one God. Moses says this, Romans 6 verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Guess what they understood that to mean? That God is one. It's as simple as that. Not that God is three parts. No, that, that, that God is one. The actual fact for that, on that sort of belief or doctrine alone, essentially many people would say that Christadelphians are not Christian because we do not believe in the Trinity. Okay. What does Wikipedia have to say in regard to Jesus. Christadelphians believe that Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah in whom the prophecies and promises of the Old Testament find their fulfilment. They believe he is the son of man in that he inherited human nature with its inclination to sin from his mother and the son of God by virtue of his miraculous conception by the power of God. Although he was tempted, Jesus committed no sin and was therefore a perfect representative sacrifice to bring salvation to sinful humankind. They believe that God raised Jesus from the death and gave him immortality and he ascended to heaven, God's dwelling place. Christadelphians believe that he will return to the earth in person to set up the kingdom of God in fulfilment of the promises made to Abraham and David. This includes the belief that the coming kingdom will be the restoration of God's first kingdom of Israel, which was under David and Solomon. For Christadelphians, this is the focal point of the gospel taught by Jesus and the apostles. Okay, I agree with that, absolutely. It is definitely the focal point of the gospel. The kingdom of God, what has been promised, and how he will achieve it through Jesus Christ. Which leads to the next point, salvation. Christadelphians believe that people are separated from God because of their sins, but that mankind can be reconciled to him by becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. By this belief in the gospel, through repentance and through baptism by total immersion in water. They do not believe that we can be sure of being saved, believing instead that salvation comes as a result of a life of obedience to the commands of Christ. After death, believers are in a state of non-existence, knowing nothing 
until the resurrection at the return of Christ. Following the judgment at that time, the accepted receive the gift of immortality and live with Christ on a restored earth, assisting him to establish the kingdom of God and to rule over the mortal population for a thousand years, called the millennium. Christadelphians believe that the kingdom will be centred upon Israel, but Jesus Christ will also reign over all the other nations of the earth. Some believe that the kingdom itself is not a worldwide, is not worldwide, but limited to the land of Israel, promised to Abraham and ruled over in the past by David with a worldwide empire. So what do we mean by this resurrection and the kingdom of God? Well, I'm sure we know, but three quotations to help us remind us. Three great quotations. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 14. <coughs> Excuse me. Numbers 14. It's about two years after the children of Israel have left Egypt under Moses and they've wandered through the wilderness and they've headed up to the promised land. Twelve spies have gone into the promised land to sort of scout the area to find out what's going on. Ten of the twelve tribes don't believe that they can conquer the land. And because of that, none of the nation, well, none of those other people believe they can conquer the land. There's only a handful of people that believe that they can. God's disappointed in this. In fact, he's so disappointed that he, to, Mo, to Moses, he says, I want to destroy them all. I want to get rid of them all. They're all unfaithful people. And Moses pleads on God's behalf to forgive them. And God does in verse 20. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But in response, God makes this point to Moses. But remember this, Moses, verse 21. But as truly as I live... All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Just in case Moses has missed the point, God says, I can forgive people who are unfaithful, but a time will come when all the earth will be filled with God's glory. Unlike what it was at that point in time. And unlike what it was amongst the people of Israel at that time. That is God's plan and God's purpose. Let's go to Habakkuk chapter 2. Halfway, well, a bit after halfway through the Bible. Let's go to Habakkuk chapter 2, talking about what God plans to do with the earth. Habakkuk's just a small book of prophecy towards the end of the Old Testament. But we make this, we find this point in Habakkuk 2 verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. So again, we're told in this prophecy from God that the earth will be filled with a knowledge or an understanding of, an appreciation of the glory of the Lord, just like the waters cover the sea. Now, if you go down to Semaphore Beach or any other beach, and you, know, you look out across the sea, and guess what the sea is covered with? Water. I mean, it's, it's, the, the, it's a bit of a ridiculous point, isn't it? Like, the sea is water. But the point is, all of the sea is water. Point being, all of the earth is going to be filled with an understanding and an appreciation of the glory of God. That's what God's plan is. Let's turn to Acts chapter 1. Because what it, what it all comes down to is the kingdom of God. That, that is essentially the, the, the establishment of God's glory in its simple terms. And it revolves around Jesus Christ returning to the earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 11. 
What we've got here is the disciples witnessing Jesus Christ, who at this time has been crucified. He has been raised back to life. He spent time with them and he's ministered to him. Now he's going to ascend up to heaven to be with God, where he currently still is. But that's not where he's going to stay. And that point is made in verse 11. And two angels are standing there alongside the disciples. And the angels say this to the disciples. Verse 11. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He will come back. Now, why will he come back? Well, if we were to read you know, earlier in the chapter, what they're talking, what they have been talking about is the kingdom of God. Verse 6. When they therefore that were come, sorry, they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So, Jesus, you were born to be king. Are you going to sit on David's throne, as has been prophesied, and restore this kingdom back to Israel? Well, that is, that is, it's called the kingdom of Israel, but it is essentially, or will be, the kingdom of God. And Jesus replies, well, it's not for you to know the times of the sea. It's not now. But the angels say, he will come back, and that's what he will do. And as Christadelphians, that's, that's a, you know, three quotes to talk about what we believe. Okay. Back to Wikipedia. Nearly finish on this whole Wikipedia thing. But it says about life in Christ. The historic commandments of Christ demonstrates the community's recognition of the importance of biblical teaching on morality. Marriage and family life are important. Christadelphians believe that sexual relationships should be limited to heterosexual marriage, ideally between baptised believers. So as a community, we're fairly conservative. And that's because of what the Bible says. It's because of what God says is right and what God says is wrong. It's not because of any other reason. God says something is right and God says something is wrong and we do our best to follow that. Okay. So, I guess perhaps a lesson for me and maybe for you is what does all that mean? What's the sort of a take-home point from that? Well, it's about our way of life, really. It's, it's our way of life. And here's two slides. Again, these are not my words. These are taken from another website called Christadelphians.com. And I guess I ask myself, and you can ask yourself, do you agree with this? We are made up of people from most walks of life. We would like to think that we are normal. <laughs> I'm not sure about myself, but... We'd like to think we are normal, but our beliefs do tend to be held with a strong conviction, and this probably reflects in our character. Our faith encourages us to be enthusiastic in our work, loyal in our marriages, generous in our giving, dedicated in our preaching, content in our circumstances. We tend to have little interest in much that the modern world finds entertaining. For example, most of us would rarely, if ever, turn to the television for comfort or relaxation. Now, I didn't write that. Someone else wrote that. I don't know who wrote that. But that's someone saying, here's how a typical Christadelphian might live their life. They're being idealistic. But shouldn't we be? Shouldn't we aim for the ideal? Aren't we following Christ? Not following me. Goodness me, if you try and follow me... You're aiming very, very low. You're not following me. We're following Christ. Another um, paragraph or two that they have is, you won't find any Christadelphian politicians, soldiers or policemen. This is because we are campaigning for the coming kingdom of God and cannot actively support any alternative ideology. We offer our support to Christ the King, and do not swear allegiance to any earthly crowned head or government. As the Bible says in Philippians 3 verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We can leave politics and the like to the providence and power of God to control. The Most High rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whoever he chooses. So in many ways, as Christadelphians, we travel through life, but we don't participate particularly in what goes on around us. Not a great deal because at the end of the day, our kingdom or, or, or our, what we're looking for is not to join a cause right now and to bear our soul and to fight for the needy right now. That's not what we live for. We actually live for the kingdom of God. Yes, we will act decently and will care for others. But where our passion is, is the kingdom of God to come. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Again, these are words of Jesus to his disciples or his followers or, should I say, to his Christadelphians. This is what Jesus says. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand, and giveth, it, giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light <coughs> excuse me, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So that, to me, says in my life, the things I say and the way that I act, when people observe them, it needs to be like a light stand, an example that doesn't make people think, what an idiot, what a hypocrite, but it needs to make people give glory to my Father in heaven. That's what Jesus Christ has asked me to do. We won't turn up James 5 verse 12, but I'll just read it out. And that is about being honest and true. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. So do what you say, mean what you say, and say what you mean, and be true as Jesus Christ was. <coughs> Excuse me. So... In conclusion, um, my next slide has four quotes. That's four. Four quotes that explain my faith. Now, it's only four quotes. It doesn't do a great job of explaining my faith. But what I mean is, with these four quotes, hopefully I can explain them and give someone who is not a Christadelphian a bit of an idea as to what it is I believe or why I believe it. But I'm, before I show you the four quotes, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to actually ask all you people for some quotes. I don't want four, but just a quote. Can, can someone here give me a quote? Like if, if you were put on the spot and said, what do you believe? Or something from the Bible that demonstrates what you believe in or why you believe it or what you hope in or what you're looking for. Just a quote. <coughs> the, the, Acts, 1 11. Acts 1 verse 11. Thanks, Matt. Yep. And this is not a right or a wrong list because there could be 400 quotes. But it's interesting to think about. So Acts 1 verse 11. Because we all have our favourite quotes, don't we? Excellent. Yep. So that is an example of what you're looking forward to and what you believe in. Is that right? Yep. Mark 16, verse 16. You read it out if you... Yep. Yep. See, these are all great quotes that they start a conversation off. They, they, you, then you explain it and why you believe it and what it means to you. Any, any others? One, two more. Come on, two more. Yep. So the gospel in summary, which is a, a, a basis to go. Yep. One more. Number 
Excellent. Well, that was the four I had. So, um, Numbers 14 verse 21, which we've already been to tonight. And again, we all have our, our favourites, don't we? We have things that mean something to us. Galatians 3, I mean, that, that ties it back to the promises made to Abraham, absolutely. Acts 17. Does anyone, what's Acts 17 verse 30 and 31 about? Does anyone remember? Pardon? Yep, in which he will judge the, judge the world. So, Paul is saying... Because he's talking to, there, from Mars Hill, to all manner of different religious people. But he's saying, there comes a time when God says, enough is enough. I want true religion. And if you don't conform, you're out. Yep. And Romans 1 verse 16 is a favourite of mine because it talks about um, the power of God. Um, just turn it up. Romans 1 verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In fact, this of Christ isn't in the original Greek, but it doesn't particularly matter. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God under salvation to everyone that believeth. Everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, that is written, the just shall live by faith. So as a Christadelphian... That's what I believe. And for all the Christadelphians in the audience, hopefully your beliefs are somewhat similar. It matters what we believe. It, it matters what we do. But certainly the hope and the glory that God has promised to all of us is worth it. It's worth our effort and is worth our time. I just want to go to one, one last quote in conclusion actual fact, which, which isn't particularly, isn't directly related to tonight's subject, but it's an example of a faith, someone doing something faithful. In, in Luke chapter 1, <coughs> sometimes living a life of a believer kind of means that, well, you're different from, like I said, everything else that goes on around you, different from the world around you, different from people around you. Now here's someone whose life was, up until a particular point in time, fairly, shall we say, ordinary? Mary. She was just a poor girl, living in Israel, and probably many other poor girls like her as well. Young woman, living quietly, minding her own business. Living faithfully, in actual fact. Verse 28. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And the angel goes to tell, to tell Mary that you're going to have a child. She's a virgin. She's got a fiancé. But she's never slept with anyone. But she's going to have a child through the power of God. And this child is going to be the son of God. Now imagine that. That would shake your day up, wouldn't it? When she woke up that morning, she wasn't thinking that was going to happen. It would change your life. You're told that you're going to bear a son and it's going to be the son of God. And no one else, imagine this, no one else is going to believe that it's the son of God because that's impossible. What a shame to bear a single girl who's pregnant. Yet she knows it's the son of God. And not many people would even believe her. Her, her life just changed in a day, didn't it? Just like that. Verse 37, the angel says, for with, God nothing, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And I love Mary's response in verse 38. Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. If that's what God wants, that's what I'll do. And I think this is just a great example of faith. And as Christadelphians, we need to show faith.